Welcome to the very first episode of This Is The Way with Artin and Michael. Uh, I'm Artin and... I'm Michael. And yes, the name is in reference to exactly what you think it is. Uh, we wanted to launch this podcast to share our experience, insight, and knowledge around career growth, side projects, side hustles, ventures, and entrepreneurship, and hopefully help pave the way for others who are in the same shoes we were in 10, 15 years ago. And maybe consider us as your Jedi you know, to guide your career. Uh, so for the first two episodes, we are going to focus on our stories, starting with Michael's on this inaugural episode. Our stories actually have a lot of crossover, which makes it interesting, at least I think. So uh, let me share a little bit about Michael first. Michael grew up in Northern California before moving to Southern California and pursuing his passion for filmmaking. After graduating with a degree in cinema arts, Michael spent the first part of his career in what he would describe as taking one step forward and two steps back. Frustrated, he became a student of Fast Risers and realized there was a method to the career advancement madness. Over the next 15 years, he increased his earning by 16x while advancing from an independent contributor to a manager, becoming an executive before he was 30 and rising to a global leader at Disney and Netflix. Uh, that led him to becoming the founder of the Velocity Labs, where he helps ambitious professionals fast track their careers, fan their paychecks, and bridge the gap between where they are and where they want to go in their career and life. So with that, Michael, uh, so kind of tell me a little bit about uh, the start of your career and how you got going and why you decided the industry you wanted to get into. So, okay, my, uh, my career background. Um, now, I guess the question is, you know, we could go all the way back to selling women's shoes at uh, Macy's, which is actually where we first met. Um, or even I could go further back to flipping burgers at McDonald's uh, or, or I could fast forward a bit. Should I fast forward? I, I, I think the Macy's story is intriguing. You should start there. Okay. So, yeah, I'll say uh, for Art and I both going to um, film school, we uh, actually ended up meeting each other at Macy's. I transferred from Northern California down to Southern California in Macy's uh, Glendale. And, um, you know, we met each other there and it turns out that we were both um, uh, also film students and, and pursuing that as a path. Now, eventually that would, you know, take us down these pathways towards, you know, these operations, strategies, executive related uh, roles. But you know, that's how we ultimately ended up meeting ironically from it. Now we also had our, right. Our burger flipping backgrounds while we didn't work at the same place. I was, a uh, uh, McDonald's. Weren't you at Carl's or something? I was at Carl's junior. Yeah. Uh, by, yeah, by exactly. Year, yeah. Yeah. So we started finding that, you know, whatever reason our lives had some, you know, um, uh, mirror action going on into it. But yeah, so, so at Macy's, um, we, I was, I was selling, were you in women's shoes when I first started? Or did you transfer to women's shoes for men's? No, I was in men's, uh, I forget what it was called, but like the high-end men's lines. And then I yeah. transferred to women's shoes. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, that's where, you know, we end up um, meeting. But, you know, fast forward yeah, a, a little bit, you know, there. I've basically spent the, uh, or at least most of the last 20 years in the media industry um, as an executive and, and global leader between DreamWorks, Disney, and then most recently at Netflix, uh, where I was a global head of production technology and operations. And um, but it did, you know, literally, I sometimes jokingly call it my Cinderella, um, story because I sold shoes to somebody at, um, Macy's who it turns out they worked at Disney. And, um, from there, you know, that introduction actually got me in the door at, uh, Disney. And then eventually through that, um, I'd get Artin in the door over at Disney and then eventually I'd leave Disney and eventually Artin pull me back over to Disney. So, you know, interesting story there. I'm sure we'll touch on more in, in, in the future, but that's. Um, high level background. And of course, since we know each other so well, if we leave anything out, we can um, obviously tell the other person what about, but I think that covers it. <laughs> yeah, that covers it. So wh when you first start at Disney, kind of what was that like and what, th what contributed to kind of your growth and pretty quick promotions in the early days of Disney? Yeah. So I would say actually at Disney, I got off to a, a bit of a slow start. Um, I mean, <laughs> At the time, I went into it and I, I was hungry and I assumed that the hard work in its own would speak for itself. But, you know, I was in, if you will, for a rude awakening because I got a taste of the realities of navigating, you know, a large organization. And um, I didn't realize it at the time, but eventually I, I learned what's now so obvious to me, which I was reporting to a leader actually at, um, at Disney 
who didn't have the best relationship with um, his boss. Um, and, you know, on top of that, the department I was in was actually on the verge or at least discussion of it being um, outsourced. Uh, Disney always does this fun thing. I mean, m most companies do this where it's like there's this insource outsource balance. You know, one minute you outsource it and then the next minute you're like, hey, we can do it cheaper. Let's insource it. Anyway, I was on one end of that. So between all of those, you know, after being there for about a year and realizing, okay, well, wait a minute, um, I'm seeing other people move into these positions, but I hadn't yet. And that's where I sort of first realized, okay, well, my boss's relationship with his boss, as well as, you know, the type of department I'm in, I started piecing these things together that would ultimately start becoming a little bit more of a, a system that I'd build, um, which I'll talk about in a, a, um, a minute. But basically at that time, I decided, you know what? I don't see how I'm going to make my movement here. I was worried about that um, uh, outsource potential. So I ended up making the jump over to DreamWorks because somebody I work with said, hey, I just interviewed for a role over there and um, you know, you should check it out. So I did, it felt like more job security at the time since again, uh, two things I mentioned with the boss relationship and the uh, um, outsource um, potential. And over there, you know, Steven Spielberg uh, is somebody that I absolutely you know, uh, love. Obviously Art and you, as, as well. The goats. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It. So like working there and being in, you know, being able to see a Spielberg regularly or Katzenberg and, and, and for that matter, a lot of other individuals, you know, like walking around lots there that, you know, Seinfeld when he's working on B movie and, you know, various other uh, celebrities, it was super exciting, but the department I was in was actually, um, uh, let's just say the culture was lacking. And that was really my first eye opening thing to wow, the importance of culture. There was only 12 people in this department, but that department managed to go through 12 people in one year. And some of them, it was actually the same role twice because people would show up and be like, what the heck is this? Now, again, those people who would leave quicker were people who had a little more experience in their career. And um, I guess you could say in that scenario, uh, more relationships options. So they were able to, you know, quickly make the pivot when they realized it wasn't right. But I stuck it out there for about a year and once more, no progress. Uh, so I made the jump back over to Disney because I realized in that department when the, um, uh, heads of the department would jump on the phone. I had a, a Boston and she would jump on the phone and with vendors and she would literally mute the phone, swear at them and, uh, bang it on the table. And I'm like, you know what? this isn't very healthy. And then uh, on top of that, the head of the department um, who my boss had worked to at the time, uh, she actually had an assistant who threw her flower pot at her and the boss just got a kick out of it and laughed. Like there was something off there anyway. So through that too, I started. Very toxic. Yeah, exactly. It. But through that, I started realizing, huh. And once more pieced a few other things together, as I, you know, continued my, you know, journey. So I, I jumped back over to Disney and this time I was under a different leader. Um, and my, you know, rose colored glasses were off, if you will, because now I realized, you know, being hungry and working hard, it wasn't going to be enough to, you know, get me where I wanted to go. So I started, um, you know, learning a lot more about, um, things at the time that is like system thinking and process engineering and, doing that had me start thinking about patterns more and the process related to, um, you know, getting promoted. It's like, I, I started to understand how things were connected a lot more and that changing one thing can affect, you know, everything else. So I, I started to get better at seeing those patterns. And then ultimately, um, I started to say, Hey, if I do this, 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 or I'm seeing other people do this, this, that can help with, you know, career progression. And then one promotion led to another and I became an executive before I was 30. And then over the next 15 year period, I was able to, you know, uh, get 16, um, uh, well, 16 X my, um, earnings, uh, with about the same number of, uh, not always promotions, but raises on some years, promotions on, um, other years. Sorry, that so was a lot, but that yeah, no, it's great. You know, I know I've been asked this question, so I'm going to ask this question for you as well. You mentioned, you know, both of us were in film school. Uh, the question I get sometimes asked is, from film school, how did you end up in the corporate world? Uh, so you want you want to touch on that and, you know, how from film yeah. school we ended up at Disney, still entertainment, but it's fairly far from what we were aspiring to be in film school. Uh and what happened exactly? Yeah, 
So um, I, I think, and I'll be curious if, you know, what you say uh, aligns very similar with this, but I had originally uh, obviously hoped to get into the directing, producing, writing, you know, uh, side of things. Heck, I wanted to be more involved in theme parks. Again, we talk about some of the Steven Spielberg, who we both greatly ad admired. And at the time, though, putting myself through film school, because I didn't, um, you know, I, that was out of my own pocket. My parents weren't um, in a position to be able to uh, help me. So I had to work the full-time job in order to, to do that. And that's where selling women's shoes worked well, because I could work every day of the week except Tuesday and Thursday, which is where I went to film school. Well, after film school, um, you know, meeting this person who was in the industry, like that was the thing. It's like I, I knew I w what I wanted to do long term, but Disney and at least being in the industry was a pathway at least I saw to being closer to what I wanted to do than, you know, selling women's shoes. But some of the reality to that is as soon as we were in that, it's like, well, then comes the regular paycheck that comes with that. Um, then comes because as I did start figuring out this, you know, advancement thing, the advancement with Jin sometimes you know, pacifies you from maybe the original aspirations and, and dreams. But I think another thing that connected then too was I ended up having, um, like you and I have both always been very interested in, um, almost problem solving and creativity have this relationship. And I think while we were really drawn to creativity and the idea of creating things, and we've learned later as we've gone on, that could be creation of a film or a movie or content, or it could be the creation of like a product um, and some of the stuff that, you know, um, we and especially you've been involved in uh, after that. So I think as I was able to connect the corporate job, if you will, with solving problems that and, 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 and that continued progression started taking, you know, me down that pathway much more than um, the filmmaking, you know, pathway. So I, I don't know if you'd add anything else to that or your story is a little bit different or not. No, that, I mean, that's exactly it. I think uh, when we get to episode two, I, I might dive into it more um, and talk about the side projects, side gigs and side hustles we were both involved in, especially in the early days of you yeah. know, not lose, trying to not lose our uh, ambition okay. and aspiration yeah. of to be filmmakers. And, you know, we were involved in various stuff and screenwriting and almost sold a couple of scripts, uh, which was pretty cool story. So, uh, I can get, I can get into those stories when we do my episode, uh, cause I'll touch right. more on the side stuff, but moving forward, uh, you mentioned systems a few times. So yeah. can you get a little into details? Like, what do you mean by systems? Cause somebody listening to this, they might think of like a software system. So what system are you talking about and what are the details around it? Yep. No, that, uh, makes perfect sense. So, um, as a way to describe it is think about, you know, if you have a, a car that you want to make go faster, somebody might think that adding a bigger engine would ultimately do the trick. But if you don't also make the wheels bigger, the car might not actually go any faster. So you have to think about all the components because everything in a car is connected and changing one thing can affect everything else. So system thinking is about, you know, looking at that big picture and understanding how all the different parts of something work together. And for me here, this is how, you know, I then look at solving, you know, problems by considering what that whole system is instead of just the parts, because, you know, as I'm sure I'll talk about later in future episodes, when, when I'm helping people accelerate their careers um, and, you know, get advancement, a lot of people just want to jump straight to, I want to have the conversation with my boss. And by the way, there's a lot of value out of that. And I would recommend somebody doing that than doing nothing at all. But if you can start actually thinking about, you know, the relationship, how you build that relationship in advance of just having the conversation or who else you need in your corner or how are you adding value or your mindset? Like it's the combination of all of those things that ultimately um, fit into this system thinking that you have to consider if you want to optimize, I guess you could say, you know, success or in the example of the car, if you want the car to actually go faster, otherwise you spend a lot of time, you know, changing one thing and it makes no difference because you didn't uh, consider the other components. So, uh, is there a specific system would you call out as attributing to your success the most versus some other systems? Um, I, 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 I feel like I'm cheating here when I, uh, say this, cause ultimately it is what I'm, uh, one of the things I'm building up now, which is around my career acceleration, uh, system or career accelerating program. 
uh, which is literally how you do start lining up all of these uh, pieces. And uh, that might be something worth us going into in the, the future, because ultimately it's each of these components. And some of them I was hinting to around mindset and value and, um, you know, those relationships that plays a key role in that. But that, that would be it for my, my career side of it is really looking at that. But then you start to get subsystems in that because on top of that, like you and I and our background, especially on the operation side, also knew um, these systems, if you will, like known as business management systems or quality management systems. So those are like business operation systems versus me looking at a, you know, career acceleration uh, sort of system. So I think there's lots of different systems uh, in our lives, um, even the habits that we have each day and what get us up in the morning or what, um, uh, yeah, how we approach it. Some people will talk about the importance of their morning routines, which again is also up for maybe debate for a future uh, one of our topics, but those type of things all can become um, systems or you could have a true system that, you know, when we look at our setups here and how we're doing this podcast, we'll build a system around that as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, you and I have been uh, so closely tied uh, to each other for the last uh, more than two decades. And because there's a lot of similarities between us and our thinking and differences. Uh, yeah. But the one similarity that we both have is we embody the growth mindset at a very early on, I feel like. And that definitely attributed to your success. Uh, but besides having this growth mind, that growth mind mindset that's really in your DNA, what other yeah. things would you say contributed to your corporate success uh, besides the system? Because the system is something you've developed, but the mindset is more soft. It's not, you know, yeah. it's a soft skill. So what, what other thing would you attribute to your corporate success? Yeah. So um, uh, mentors, you know ultimately had lots of, you know, the mentors ultimately introduced me to even some of the system thinking that I was mentioning, you know, before, which is a big component, but, um, mentors also in general, like, uh, actually look at somebody like you, you know, that I, uh, uh, you know, in some terms would call a growth, you know, buddy in other ways, you in your own right have been a mentor. And I think this is where we've been able to like be there for each other and that bounce board, which has really been great to pick each other's brains and, and, or, or help each other off our, you know, our ledges, if you will, when we needed to. And, um, so that, that would be, or even taking an idea by the way, and like having somebody like you who could be like, eh, it's probably not the best. What if we did this? Like that to me has been super valuable. And, you know, on top of that, like this idea of, um, virtual mentors too, because people talk about mentors and you may think about those in terms of your workplace, but, there's, um, or whatever it is you're pursuing, but virtual mentors to me are those that I may not have ever met, but I've had the chance to read their book or listen to their, you know, podcast. And you actually had introduced me to, um, uh, a author and a, a book early on. It was, um, Steven Seibold, if I get his name right, but it was 177 <laughs> mental toughness secrets of the world class. Yeah. And I think amazing, like, amazing. Yeah. I feel like it's very underrated and lesser known outside of that certain community of uh, always thinking about mindset, but it does some amazing nuggets in there. Yeah, no, it, exactly. And I think, I can't remember, who who turned you on to that book? Do you remember? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, I think it might have been somehow a Tony Robbins mention of him. Okay then got me to look into it. Got it. I wasn't sure because I remember too, Patrick at the time was in a lot of stuff. I wasn't sure if, you know, um, that. yeah, I don't, I don't think it was Patrick. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. All right. Yeah. I digress. Yeah, I but, I mean, it was such a long time ago. Yeah. Well, that, but that book in general to me, like what was great about it is it had these 177, you know, things in there. Um, and each one was just a page long but it exposed me to a different way as it would look at it, the world-class thinking versus, you know, the rich, middle, poor, however it was broken out. And then through there, it also sometimes had an action or activity. And then it also had like a book for further reading. And so that one turned me on to actually a book called Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goldman with, um, which really got me thinking about managing my own, you know, emotions. And uh, that was long before, you know, the corporate training as we advanced through the ranks and, you know, it's something they wanted to give to, to leaders. Like that was something I had adopted earlier on thanks to um, uh, that book. And I think, again, I talk about it from virtual mentors, but I'm also now tying it to another thing that really helped me was 
really thinking about it from the people component. And, and that book was one of those that helped me to do that. And it started this fascination with human psychology and, you know, always trying to think about things more through other people's lenses. Um, and between that emotional side and then the process side of it, I think have really been uh, key. And then obviously got to give a shout out to team, mem- you know, my team members. So not only were they, you know, critical to my success and, and helped me develop to become a stronger leader, but they also, you know, were ones on the day-to-day basis who were actually making sure that things were happening and, and, and getting uh, done. So, yeah, I guess if I had to sum it all up, I'd say it's, you know, a love of learning, fascination with human behavior and being surrounded by people I can learn from, be it my team or be it, you know, um, uh, some of these other mentors. Your kind of journey of Disney, then Netflix, uh, how did you decide that, you know what, I'm at a place in my life where I'm going to regret if I don't attempt to truly be an entre- entrepreneur and a business owner? Uh, how did you make that transition and kind of tell us a little bit about the first business you went into? You know, you and I actually had early on one of the first things we did when we were just still early in our careers, we had for a moment there um, uh, a local commercial production. Do you remember? Do you remember the name of the commercial that we did or the company? I, I remember it was a furniture company. Yeah, ba- basic chic. Basic um, chic. That's right. Yeah, what it was called. Huh. We were probably yeah. Right, yeah. We we set up a whole uh, green screen studio inside the furniture shop. Yeah. No, it's, it was, uh, and again, you know, afterwards, I think, you know, the, the work and the other things into it, it's like, whoo, like for a match, we, we charged on it. And, um, anyway, that, but that was like, you know, I would say a for a, I mean, you know, obviously for me as a, as a kid, there were different things I looked at and, and, you know, toy with, but nothing that I ever really, you know, completely, um, uh, pursued, but, um, I've always wanted to, you know, between that, between some of the, the product side of things that you and I had, uh, uh, worked on and, you know, I have a graveyard of some that, you know, didn't you know go anywhere, but it's like this, this has always been that passion and, and interest. And I had considered for a while about, you know, leaving corporate America to pursue, um, actually business acquisition, if not growing velocity labs, which is, um, ultimately a company I created where, uh, the idea is here, like with, um, uh, career accelerator, this program I'm launching is to basically help people achieve their goals, you know, um, faster. And I, Last year, before I jumped in to do this full time, um, I also launched um, a, a short term rental, uh, which you know is far from me, about two thousand miles away. But ultimately, you know, looking at the right place for the property, I have a team out there who manages that. And you know, e- even in that scenario, there, it's like when I start seeing, and I know you had some real estate, you know, uh, in the past too. But like when you start seeing, like, wow, okay, look at how much money I can make for something like this that while not completely passive, you know, is not require a lot of hands on, but it, it, it's something I've always known. But as I start to see in practice now, um, money that can, you know, happen by using leverage or by being okay, not, you know, being able to, um, you're not doing everything yourself, but that means you can now, you know, scale yourself better to other things. And just seeing that bring in money for me on a regular basis is like, uh, another one that just made me say, all right, here we go. Let's make this leap. And I was going to take the leap and go more down that way. But now that, you know, interest rates and other things, I'm, I'm, I'm hedging my bets a little bit here. And now I'm moving forward with the career accelerator program where I'm ultimately helping professionals fast track their careers and basically sharing the career success systems that I was mentioning earlier. Um, in case uh, people aren't familiar with the terminology short-term rentals, and what Michael's talking about is, you know, Airbnb and uh, VRBO, kind of that that industry of uh, owning property but renting it out to vacationers, um, which is amazing. You know, I've always uh, loved real estate. Uh, when the when I got a chance to buy my first investment property right after the Great Recession. Um, I, I didn't know what I was getting into because it was my first one. But in hindsight, I got in at the perfect timing because it was almost at the bottom of the market during that last uh, recession. 
so I'm, I'm definitely monitoring what's happening now, but it seems like things are very different with the market right now, even though interest rates are up. But it's fascinating. I, I think we'll we'll probably touch on real estate in, in a future episode, but it's one of those topics that I, I really enjoy. Um, how did you uh, how did you go about uh, just thinking about you want to do short term rentals, and then what was your process to pick where you're going to even buy a property at? Yeah. Um, uh, so at the time I was looking at the returns and you could get some pretty incredible returns, um, especially when interest rates were really low and, um, you, you know, prices, they did this crazy jump during, you know, COVID, which nobody expected going into COVID. So like that started eating the returns up a bit, but you can still get, you know, a, a good return on the right property of at least, you know, around 20% and even more if you start thinking about things they call like land hacking, uh, where you can, you know, build out other units on the property. So to me, it was, it was the returns that was really appealing. And, um, so that's when we started looking a bit and then started considering places across the U S where there was, um, uh, they were optimal nightly rate in occupancy versus the cost of the property. So we ended up in a place in, uh, with a place in, um, an area called, uh, Dahlonega, uh, Georgia, which is about an hour and a half north ish of, um, Atlanta. And, and anyway, so yeah, so, so, and we, you know, jump straight, uh, into that one. And, uh, you know, for me, I see that as, as one, like, I think real estate will be a really big component of some of my future of investing, just because there's some big tax benefits and other things related to it. But I do think a future episode, as you said, would be really good to talk about that. Cause if I could go back and give myself more advice, it would have been to get into more, real estate, you know, obviously hindsight, when you look at it, you and I are always the type of because now the time, the economy, and I'm sure so many other people do, but now I know with this experience, like time, um, as long as you have like a 10 year horizon for real estate, you're, you're, you know, going to be in good shape generally, um, uh, speaking. So, and I think I would have even at an earlier age got into more of like a, um, uh, rental, um, or not, uh, uh, what is the term for it? Um, Going blank. It's not rental arbitrage in that case. Although I guess it could be too, but basically where you have a place you buy and you have somebody else who's either renting out rooms from you, or if it's like a duplex, they're literally paying for your place because they're in one and you're in the other. And like, I think especially a lot of people who are just starting off, like that would be a great way to go before you have a family as a way to then, um, start increasing your own, you know, earnings that way, because you're not having to pay for a property. You just need to get the down payment obviously for it. So, yeah. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll definitely get into very specific stuff around this uh, yeah. and just very specific advice. But to kind of just wrap up this first episode of our new adventure, and we don't really know what we're doing, but we're going to figure it out as we go. Um, you provided one advice, but what are some other kind of advice you would give to folks that, you know, your 25-year-old yourself, what advice would you give them? And then... To wrap it up, what's some of the, what's one or two advice that you got in, in in your career that have stayed with you and are going to stay with you forever? I'd say, um, uh, you know, being clear on ultimately what we want to accomplish and you know the the, the impact that somebody will have is is really important and rooting that in emotion as much as possible. Like I look at a lot of people who very successful and it's like oftentimes they they you know knew what they wanted to achieve and they just kept kept going for it and i think even then when i think about that um uh i mean if i just think about it in terms of well not crazy success but still the short-term rental which is doing well for us and scary to you know go across the the u.s for something like that it's like ultimately there are many um things along the way that could have had us you know, stop at that. But because we, we had this vision of where we were trying to take our lives at the time, even if that pivots slightly, that was still enough to get you through or to get us through the, the difficult times. And I, I think, you know, something, you know, when I think about our careers, well, we got so lost in the career and the pursuit of that actually at the time that we didn't um, stay as focused on that dream or we fed it with these other things that um, I remember, what was it? Was it advice you got early on that, we might have pushed past a little bit and still had this level of success, but what was it? Was it from, is it Jeremy from Miramax? Was that his name who gave you the advice? Yes, it was. Yeah. His name was Jeremy. What did he say? Uh, he said something along the lines of, uh, don't let Disney suck out all your creativity 
because it will happen if very quickly if you let it. And, and I think that's important because I think that goes for any job. If people don't find the right balance of still keeping whatever their emotional driver, you know, it, whatever this thing is that it's rooted in that they want to accomplish because they could see how it's going to allow them to either live the life they want or have the impact that they want to. And again, you know, this isn't meant to complain like you and I both have had good lives in our careers and we work with people that we really enjoy working with, but it's still one of those things that it's like, um, that's definitely, you know, something that becomes a little bit of a challenge if, if, you know, you do waver between, well, maybe this is okay here. And like when I, some people I work with, I was just talking to somebody recently, a client and, and part of them wants to long-term become like a CEO is what they've talked about. But they were also mentioning about how much they enjoyed their, um, their current boss and working with their current boss. And there's this comfort and safety that comes with that. And because they're in that comfort and safety, I could see that they're not actually as focused on their longer term aspirations. And that ultimately can get in the way then because we get comfortable and we start feeling safe. So I think you've got to continue to push outside your uh, comfort zone. I think on top of that too, is there's this idea of focusing on what matters the most. Um, I like to term people call uh, MITs. That's not meant to be the, you know, university, uh, but rather supposed to be most important things and how you can do that, you know, each day, what are the most important things that you can focus on and making sure you get those out of the way so that you could continue to pursue whatever it is that you're trying to pursue, you know, uh, long-term. And by the way, that might be your own business aspiration, but that might also just be your, um, uh, uh you know, the career and what you want to, you know, uh, accomplish and stuff in your career as well. Um, surrounding yourself with others is, you know, who want to achieve the similar results is another key thing. Like you and I have always had each other, but I think that's one thing that, um, we haven't been as good about is surrounding ourselves with that strong network of people who want to do similar. And I think actually that's, um, probably delayed some of, um, what I know you and I would have also liked to have achieved at this, you know, point as we're in our ripe old, you know, uh, forties, our game's not over yet, but still it's one of those things. that it's just We're just getting started. What are you talking about? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. Yeah, that's it. Maybe that's the podcast name. Just getting started. No. So, um, so, and then, being disciplined is obviously, you know, super, uh, uh, critical because, you know, there's, if, if people aren't doing a certain amount each day, like right now, as I ready this course for, or this program for launch, I've given some people access to the scripts to be able to look at and go through. And like, you know, some of them are super disciplined and get through it. And some of them, despite the fact that they've mentioned what they want and what they're trying to get out of their career, they're just, they're just not dedicating the time to it. And honestly, that makes me sad at times because I want to see them be successful with it. But that's, that's, it really comes down to discipline and like, you know, motivation is going to wander, but discipline is what makes a difference. And, you know, taking it back to somebody you uh, love and represented on the wall behind you there is uh, Kobe, you know, he was putting in twice as much time as all the others um, on a, you know, daily basis, you know, cause he wanted to be the best and that's what it required in his mind. And um, he was right, you know, and ultimately he decided to bypass like hanging out with his friends because he knew that, you know, doing double time would make him the best. And if he wasn't disciplined, we wouldn't have ever known of Kobe, I think, but you know, Kobe much better. You could, you could, you know, <laughs> share if you agree or disagree. Future episode. We can debate uh, basketball yeah. because uh, I can go days about the game today versus the game in the past and uh, what's happening now versus the Jordan uh, Kobe era. Yeah. I can go on forever. It's a, it's a, it's a, one of those fascinating debates. Maybe we'll get invited to talk about it on ESPN. Who knows? There you go. Perfect. I, I will say too, this was another thing when Art and I first met, that was when there was a rivalry between the Lakers, um, Art and being, you know, from, uh, LA most of his, his, his life. And then me being from Sacramento area for the first half of my life and then Southern California, the second half. And like, so at that point, while I didn't follow basketball a lot, knowing he loved, um, uh, Lakers. And then I was, a um, from Sacramento that got me into basketball. Cause I'm like, okay, we had that rivalry and we could smack talk and, <clears throat> you know, just speaking of smack talk, you know, the Kings right now are doing pretty darn well there. We're I like, know it's pretty surprising that the, the, the Kings are uh, in, a, in a much better place than the Lakers, even though yeah. on paper they shouldn't, <laughs> but they, it, they're doing good. The other funny thing is I swear today, I don't even think I can, name a player anymore on it. Like that's the other thing between work and between now these entrepreneur things, it requires a lot of, you know, additional time, but time I love towards this, this, this becomes the sport, you know, if, if you will, pursuing this. So. Oh, you forgot to mention kids three on your side, two on my side. It makes watching TV a little more difficult. 
Yeah, that's a great point. In fact, I usually find my TV time in, you know, uh, I'm sure some people could say, oh, you're, you're not maximizing your time, but this is my like give when I'm in the evenings working on, you know, stuff. And again, I, I enjoy, you know, working on things I'm working on, but I'll usually have the TV on in the background and it's like enough that I know what's going on in, you know, the last of us or, or, you know, uh, Ted Lasso. And, uh, but it is rare. I'll sit down and truly focus on something. Um, and it's just, it's, it's sort of my, I don't know. I don't want to call it work break, but it's my way of like compromising when I'm like, all right, I'm going to go do these things, but I've got a little bit of entertainment going on in the background. But yeah, cause otherwise you're right with kids. No, although I am getting them to watch stuff now, like, um, some of the history channel specials and things like that, the Titans and all the other stuff that I know you are also a fan of. So it's a nice excuse to be able to go back and watch that kind of stuff again. And we watched a lot of For movies. kind of the movies. last, uh, kind of parting words you mentioned, uh, about, the. Uh, career accelerator program that you're working on now and you've given scripts for others to read for feedback. Uh, who exactly is your target audience of that program that uh, should be on the lookout for this program? Um, so this is a great question. And I think I'll tie into some of your future stuff you talk about, especially when it comes to, um, you know, looking at uh, side hustles or product. The reason I say that is because, well, who I think my audience is now, we will see if that changes when I actually get the course out into the hands of, of the mini or the program out there, because I, um, my main target now, as I've been building it is with, you know, the, uh, professionals in mind, I can't help, but think heavily in corporate, but to be honest, it's, it's, it's a product that will help, you know, um, uh, anybody who is seeking to uh, grow their career, accelerate their career, fast track their career. Um, but I would mainly focus around uh, professionals, um, those especially going from manager to director. But to be honest, like if for my kids or for, for people I know, my nephews and those, uh, those who are coming out of college, I actually think if, if they're choosing college, which is again, probably another debate uh, for the future, um, the importance of college in the future when there's so much great education and programs and courses out there, but I, I think that it actually, if I had this when I first joined um, corporate America, I, I would have shaved several years off of my process and got a lot more confident faster around things. But my main focus and sweet spot are those who you got to be at that place mentally where you're starting to realize now, like sometimes you got to go through some of those learnings on your own before you're like, okay, how do I take a shortcut here and figure out a faster way around this? So that's where I'm mainly targeting, targeting, you know, those mid-level uh, professionals. And then we'll see when the program comes out, what it ends up actually informing. And I may have to tweak it and change it. Who, who knows? Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Uh, hope everybody enjoyed uh, learning about Michael's background and, and the amazing insights and advice that he had. Uh, if you kind of want to support us, make sure you click on follow, subscribe, whatever platform you're on, because uh, that would be very helpful to us and share. Uh, and then be on the lookout for the next episode where uh, we'll switch tables and Michael will be interviewing me. Mm -hmm.